Hello, and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. I am excited to continue on in setting up the context for Exodus chapter 15, where we're looking at, last week we looked at the literary features of this song as it's sitting next to a narrative that describes what God did, and it's now a a poetic portrayal of what God did. This week, we're going to focus on another historical connection that I find particularly fascinating. Because scholars tell us that it's not common at all in the ancient Near East to have a prose and poetic account of the same event. In fact, we have only one other example of this happening in the ancient Near East, and that is Ramses II's Battle of Kadesh. Now, you may never have heard of the Battle of Kadesh before, but if you lived in ancient Egypt, you certainly would have, because it is called the most extensively advertised event of ancient Near Eastern history. We have examples of at least five temples or monumental walls that have stone reliefs depicting this event, where images of Pharaoh in his chariot defeating Uh, his enemies in the Battle of Kadesh, is put alongside text. And sometimes the text is bilingual so that people can read it in, in two different languages. And what's really fascinating is that these texts combine or set alongside each other a prose or narrative account of the battle with a poetic account of the battle. This particular battle dates to 1274 B.C., So if you take the later date of the Exodus, which I'm inclined to do, then this is in the neighborhood of the Exodus, probably um, within 30 years of the Exodus happening. Um, This is Pharaoh's big moment, uh, the defeat of the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh. If you want to read more about this, Um, In more detail, I'm drawing heavily here on Joshua Berman's article in the collected volume, Did I Not Bring Israel Out of Egypt?, which is edited by James Hoffmeyer. He was our guide or our our leader of the tour that I went on to Egypt, and he's a very well-regarded Egyptologist. Okay, so what does Joshua Berman point out? Uh, Some of the similarities between the account of the Battle of Kadesh and the biblical account of the defeat of Pharaoh at the sea. So first we have some prose connections. First, um, in both accounts, the army is surprised by chariots. The king wins the battle single-handedly. Well, the rest of the army just watches. Um, So in the case of Israel's story, that would be Yahweh wins single-handedly against Pharaoh. The people don't actually fight. The enemy is dismayed over the divine help that's being given to uh, to Pharaoh slash to Israel. The enemy drowns in both accounts, and in both accounts there are no survivors. And the prose account climaxes with praise for the king's strong arm that brought salvation. So some very striking similarities between the biblical account of the Red Sea or Sea of Reeds and Pharaoh's Battle of Kadesh prose account. Now for the poetry. In both contexts, the poem about the Battle of Kadesh and the poem about the defeat at the sea, we have praise for the name of the king and or the name of Yahweh, praise for the king's strong arm or Yahweh's strong arm. The enemies are compared to chaff or stubble. The king is without equal or Yahweh is without equal, and the king and and or Yahweh intimidates foreigners. So when foreigners hear about this victory, they are totally intimidated. And so that's true in both accounts. It seems to me impossible for there to be so much overlap between the two without there being any kind of historical contact or connection between them. Uh, It seems that Yahweh has intentionally mimicked Pharaoh to communicate superiority, or that the writers of the biblical text are styling the account of the defeat of Pharaoh in ways that are intentionally mimicking Pharaoh's own victory accounts, the ones they got tired of hearing over and over again and seeing over and over again while they were in Egypt. They're now showing that Yahweh is beating Pharaoh at his own game. 
Uh, the Pharaoh wanted to brag about this particular victory. Yahweh's victory over Pharaoh has the same parameters. There's one other dimension of this uh, set of similarities that I find really fascinating, and that is that Pharaoh, as he goes into the wilderness to engage in this battle, takes with him a war tent, a particular tent that is depicted on multiple temple walls in which we can see uh, we can see an outer boundary around his tent that he stays in, and then in the center of that outer boundary, there's another inner tent that has a division in it. So one third is the is the place, one third of that inner tent is the place where Pharaoh himself sits on his throne and is protected by winged cherubim, winged creatures. And then two thirds of that inner tent is the sort of reception area um, that that only only his closest advisors would be allowed to come into. Here's what's mind blowing about this: the war tent has the same dimensions, the same proportions as Israel's tabernacle, and Israel's tabernacle is styled as the tent of Yahweh, the God who just defeated Pharaoh at the sea, the tent of Yahweh, sort of the throne tent in which in the most holy place, there's winged cherubim that are that are um, covering or guarding the place where where Yahweh is is thought to have placed his feet. So they, they knew that the tabernacle could not contain Yahweh, but they imagined it as the footstool for his throne. And so that part, that most sacred part of the Israelite tabernacle is protected by winged creatures. And then only the priests can come into the the holy place of the tabernacle, also part of that inner tent. And then the outer boundaries of the tent have that same proportion, the same proportions uh, as Pharaoh's war tent. And, And then camped around Pharaoh's war tent were four companies of soldiers, one on each side. And similarly, for ancient Israel, uh, there were four groups of three tribes each camped around Yahweh's tabernacle. So there are so many striking similarities to this. If you visit Egypt and look in the museums, you'll find all sorts of objects that are reminiscent of Israel's tabernacle furniture, including things that look like the Ark of the Covenant, tent curtains that that remind us of the of how the tent curtains for the tabernacle were possibly constructed imagery like angelic figures with wings that protect the deity or protect the king the king being carried uh, by priests who are who have poles on their shoulders so there's so many potential points of contact between egyptian worship and egyptian uh ritual and the biblical account of the tabernacle. And so, and we'll explore some of those in more detail when we get to the tabernacle chapters, if we ever make it that far through Exodus. Um, But for now, I just wanted to note that this battle of Kadesh not only helps explain why the biblical story has this prose and poetic account side by side and why it has the particular themes that it does, but it also sets us up for understanding why God chooses to dwell in a tabernacle, it seems as though he's choosing a symbol that would have made sense to ancient Israelites. They would have said, oh, right, the the divine king is in our midst and, and we need to protect the sanctity of that area and camp around him. So God is accommodating himself to cultural realities that made sense to his people as they came out of Egypt. It's also no wonder that God's victory at the sea then is followed by an eruption in song. Women usually led celebrations in song after a military victory. Women would dance and play drums, hand drums, to welcome back the warriors. And so here, uh, the women are singing and dancing, and uh, the whole community joins in in song, celebrating the victory of the divine king of Yahweh, who single-handedly routed Pharaoh and his army. So next week, we'll begin looking at the song itself, going uh, section by section through the song, and I'll and I'll uh, try to bring out some of its key themes and interesting insights. Until then, have a great week. Mm-hmm.